This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Welcome to Plain Talk Live. I'm your host, Rob Port. So, the North Dakota Legacy Fund, well, I, I should back up a little bit. North Dakota has lots of funds, and some of those funds are controlled, or their investments are controlled by what's called the State Investment Board. Um, and when I say North Dakota has lots of funds, um, I'm not kidding around. You should go check out uh, the North Dakota Treasurer's Office, actually former Treasurer Kelly Schmidt, did a really good job of creating a, a, uh, a database on her website of all the various state funds, the Common Schools Trust Fund, uh, the Street Strategic Investment and Improvement Fund. Uh, there's, there's a whole laundry list of them, and they all have different balances, and a lot of them are managed in different ways. But the State Investment Board manages some pretty big funds, and as you might understand from the name, uh, they do investing. Um, they invest the legacy fund. They invest our pensions funds, uh, funds like the uh, Public Employees Retirement System, PERS, the TFFR, Teachers Fund for Retirement. Um, but the legacy fund, I think, is what we're going to focus on today. And our legislature made some, some pretty big changes in, in how that fund is going to be invested or, or, or should be funded, how that investment strategy should work specifically for the legacy fund. Now, typically, if you're talking about a pension fund, the the purpose of a pension fund is is pretty simple. You want to earn money so that it can pay out uh, retirement payments to uh, re- retirement benefits to people who have earned them, whether they're teachers or public employees. Um, so you want to have a good return on investments so that you can turn around and then meet those those obligations of the fund. The legacy fund is something different. It's not a pension fund. It's a fund that was created for North Dakota's legacy. Now, I had former Governor Ed Schaefer on, and he kind of indicated that he wished he wished they had never called it the Legacy Fund. In, in his mind, it was a fund that was intended to help level out North Dakota's finances. Um, but I, I don't know. Not everybody agrees. The name of it is Legacy Fund, and I think that's the way most people, when I look at the legislature, when I look at our, our current crop of elected leaders, that's what most people are, are, are looking at it as as a way to a big pile of money that can be leveraged in different ways to help North Dakota in legacy type ways. So we're not talking about one time projects. We're talking about making big changes to our, our state uh, and the things in our state that, that are going to last a long time and, and have a big impact. So um, to that end, the legislature passed a bill that requires 20% of the legacy fund be invested in North Dakota projects in in two significant ways. First, it would be invested in infrastructure projects. Now, the, the way that typically happens is, um, and this happens all over the place. And in fact, the Legacy Fund is already invested in this way. But what happens is, is a is, let's say a city or a county or something wants to build a new piece of infrastructure. Um, maybe it's a water treatment plant or a sewage plant or something like that. Something deeply unsexy that nobody uh, nobody talks about or nobody thinks about until all of a sudden it's not working. And then it's pretty important. So when they want to build that, essentially what they do is they put out a bond and that bond gets funded and people invest in the bond because, well, it's a safe way to invest. It gets a pretty gets a predictable rate of return and the legacy funds invested in bonds. So the idea is we're going to invest the legacy fund in North Dakota bonds. It'll help us do those bonds cheaper. It'll help us do those bonds quicker, which means we can build infrastructure quicker and cheaper. And boy, that starts to turn into a real big deal for the state of North Dakota. It's stuff we were going to do anyway, but if we can do it faster and we can do it cheaper, that's a good thing. The other thing it does is it makes capital available for North Dakota. Now, since statehood, access to capital is something that the state of North Dakota has struggled with. Um, Historically, we don't have a lot of capital available in our state. Um, I mean, there's some available. I don't want to say there's none, but, you know, it's 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 hard to draw investment here. Let's put it that way. Um, And the other challenge our state has faced is economic diversification. And then the two go hand in hand, right? Our big things is oil and soil, right? Uh, We have a lot of natural resources. We have a lot of oil. We have a lot of coal. We do a lot of agriculture. 
And those things are wonderful, and we want to keep doing all of those things, but we want them to be smaller slices of a bigger pie, which is to say we want to do a lot of other stuff too. Well, if we have more capital available, maybe we can have a better chance of doing some of those other things. So here to talk with me about all of that is Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford. Now, the reason why the Lieutenant Governor is important to this discussion, because it just so happens by dint of his office, unlike the Vice President, we give our Lieutenant Governor something to do. Uh, and one of those things, or th <laughs> many things to do, and one of those things is um, is, is sitting uh, sitting at the head of the State Investment Board. Although, uh, Brent, have you heard the old joke about why lieutenant governors look out the window in the morning or why they don't no. look out the window in the morning. I should say that's, I just, I screwed up my own joke. They don't look out the window in the morning so that they'll have something to do in the afternoon. <laughs> you heard that one. That's a good no. one. It's, it's not actually true, but it's uh, it makes me laugh every time I hear it. And maybe it, it applies to like vice presidents too. Um, all right. So legislature made some big changes, Brent. What does that mean for the state investment board? Well, they're exciting changes. It's, it's uh Something that the governor and I asked as we were running for office in 2016 is why why are there not more opportunities for investing these legacy funds in the state? Because we were hearing it as we were traveling the state that people are wondering, what are we building this nest egg for? And I'm assuming I'd have to look back, but I think it was around five billion what the legacy fund might have been back at that point. And and then it turns out that they the legislators had had already decided not to touch the earnings until 2017 so so from 2010 to 2017 the earnings were piling back in with the with the accumulated principal from from the 30 percent of oil taxes that 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 feed the legacy fund and so not only have 30 percent of the oil taxes flowing into it during the boom times but but those dollars are then earning and there are earning investment earnings at the same time so so the thing was building rapidly people are wondering what impacts it'll have for our state so one of the jobs that, as you mentioned, that I have as lieutenant governor is to chair the state investment board. So to jump into that board day one during a legislative session is quite a learning curve uh, to learn from from those that have been there before me, from from Lieutenant Governor Wrigley, from Treasurer Schmidt, from Dave Hunter, from from the um, land commissioner Lance Gaby, been on there for a while at the time. Um, Superintendent Rob Leck from Jamestown is the vice chair. He's very savvy on this board, Very takes it very seriously, and a uh, very good board member, understands the governance issues and the history of, of, of how the protocols work. But what uh, struck me interesting is how, as a sovereign wealth fund, the theory for sovereign wealth funds is, is to diversify and not to just keep investing upon yourself. And so, so when you look around other sovereign wealth funds, they're on by and large only investing one percent within their own within their own area that's covered which is very interesting and and so and we, we knew that wouldn't fly with the north dakota with the north dakota voter with the taxpayer and so so this is something that the governor and i had these conversations immediately and um as you as you as you're there for more meetings you see the protocols you see that institutional investing is quite a science of its own it's not like what we do for our own iras and our own 401ks where you're picking different classes of of mutual funds etc and and parking your funds in there and letting them grow until you retire i mean this is active investing where you're out you're buying portion uh, equity in a company and they're pooling them together and these investment managers have handled billions of dollars at once and so it's a it's a pooling of as you mentioned infrastructure projects a pooling of equity investments in 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 companies all over the country and um and, and i have to say before i move on that not only is only one percent of that money generally invested back in those local jurisdictions but but each each um so sovereign wealth fund or trust fund has a board or a group that that tells us the state investment board how you invest these assets. So that's another thing you learn is if you're looking at, hey, the stock market was great last year, 12% annual return on on an average S and P type stock. Why are we not earning 12%? Well, it just so happens that each of those has a different asset allocation. Asset allocation means how much of it are you going to put in equity? How much are you going to put in in treasuries? How much are you going to put in real estate? In fixed income investments? etc. And for for instance, the PERS accounts, retirement accounts are more like 60% equity, whereas the legacy fund is 50% equity because of the provisions where the legislature could take out 15% at any given time. Any Every two years, they could vote 
to expend all the earnings and take 15% of the principal out. So you have to be ready for a large distribution like that. So that was what was chosen was a 50% allocation into equity. Now within equity, it's not just go out and buy blue chip stocks. It's very diversified within that as well. And the Legacy Advisory Committee, who's made up of legislators and President of the Bank of North Dakota, um, OMB Director, Tax Commissioner, they they put together a recommendation where I, I believe 20% of that 50 is international, the other 30 is, is domestic. So there's a directive to invest 20% in international equities that's given to us as State Investment Board. And that's how all the other the other clients for the State Investment Board work as well. For instance, very interesting, look at WSI, Workforce Safety's $2 billion trust fund they have and their returns. They were averaging 6 to 7% return on a five-year basis, and they only have 25% in equities. So it's very interesting to look at the different allocation of equity versus fixed income versus real estate and what that might bring for an overall blended return for the fund. Um, and so, so when people look at legacy fund, and, and ask why is your return what it is for the last five years it's around it's up to nine percent for the last one year year over year from march 31 to march 31 it's actually over 30 percent with only 50 percent of it in equity but that we bought a hedging tool we paid for buying for buying low and selling high on the way up out of the out of the pit from covid that was happening a year ago and so we had a lot of good buys made good income now we're at 30 percent return year over year from march 31 with only 50 percent in equities this can all change on a dime as equity markets go down then all of a sudden your fixed income that sits there at a two and three percent return looks a lot better when your equities dive 30 or 40 percent of valuation you still need to have some of it holding steady for when that day comes that you have to distribute out earnings or distribute out potentially 15 percent so it's 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 a it's a quite a complicated world when you get into how the state investment board does business and we operate with consultants and asset managers and that's who does the work for us but the state investment board is um, made up of of ha basically half elected officials and the other half are representatives from from the boards that we do business with tffr pers wsi etc so it's uh it's it's quite the business that we're in at State Investment Board of 20 billion under investment. 14 House Bill 1425 was part of the legacy trifecta bills this time, which very proud of the legislature for moving these forward. Uh, they had an interim committee and talked about these issues. They had a lot of different input from across the state. Um, what happened was 1425 was prime sponsored by Representative Mike Nathy from Bismarck. Did a great job championing it, championing this bill. He had innovators coming from across the state saying, hey, there's a there's a place for this. We are a venture capital desert. One number we, we received at our state investment board meeting was that maybe as low as $30 million of venture capital was placed in North Dakota last year. So if you're that company that's ready to ramp and go statewide, then you're going nationwide and you need to go, you build 10X from where you are today. A local bank likely isn't going to give you a loan for 10 times what you've been doing before, but that's where you need investment bankers and venture capital and more access to the to the markets that you might have if you were a business that was in a larger metro area around the coast. So with what the legislature has done in 1425 is 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 giving us cover basically to invest more than that one percent within the state. They're saying up to ten percent in equity. So so what we we created a North Dakota private equity fund that would be that already has 250 million with an investment manager that's already been hired based on previous relationships to get off the ground moving and uh, we're, we'll be moving forward with 250 million dollars compare that to 30 million of venture capital 250 million dollars to deploy in this state in equity investments in those 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 ramp up phase companies so it's an exciting time for north dakota to see this capital coming back to us to invest here to have the synergies of tax base job growth and that capital formation right here in north dakota the second piece is the fixed income not quite as sexy or interesting, but I tell you what, you're right. It's super important until the, it, it, when they when they don't work. And so, so um, for instance, in Watford City, we had to build a $30 million wastewater treatment facility. They, they they say call them wastewater, call them water reuse facilities, Mayor. Don't call them wastewater, but they're water reuse facilities. It's $30 they're, million. They're, they're, they're sewage plants. They're sewage plants. Town. They're sewage plants. Let's just let's just they call are. what it is. So we know, we, we know what's in there. You're not going to pretty it up. Right. So $30 million for a little town like Watford City and someone buys those bonds. And so you're right. 
that's that's how the market works on those type of investments and and so anyway that there's the same amount up to 10 percent of legacy funds available per house bill 1425 for very low interest long-term amortization for infrastructure funding at, at that very low rate similar to what we already have done another thing i failed to mention is we had the match program where where they would the bank of north dakota would give the state investment board a cd at a really low rate, like say one and a half or two percent, they would only mark it up a half percent and put that into a fund where they would provide public-private infrastructure investment at the low rate of interest for projects such as bringing natural gas down to the Bobcat plant in Gwinter, bringing natural gas up to the the new ADM announced soybean crush facility up in Jamestown at Spiritwood. That'll be using the match program. So we already had that one in place. I can tell you we did not promote it enough. We did not brag about it, talk about it. That these are your legacy fund dollars yeah. at work. We should have put a big bow around it, said your legacy fund dollars at work. Did not do that. Between bankers and investment advisors and state investment board is, is probably too quiet. But but we're, we're going to have that on steroids now with House Bill 1425. So it's going to be an exciting time. Well, the, the cool thing about it is, too, is, is that none of this is actually spending legacy fund dollars, right? All of this, all of this is investment. All of this gets a rate of return. And yep. about the only thing we might be giving up is maybe if we invested in some different ways, we would have got a, a little bit higher rate of return. But I think the consensus is, and again, this legislation flew through 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 the legislature, is we're willing to, 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 to pay that opportunity cost, if you will, in exchange yep. for a lot of the other good things that this is going to be able to do, such as facilitate these projects that are going to build. I mean, yeah, we may be losing some return, but what are we going to gain if we can help a project that's going to employ, you know, a couple hundred people or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. If we could do that stuff faster, if we could do that stuff quicker, it's great. I, I know one thing that, that's been a little bit of a bone of contention is the legislature indicated that that they wanted that they wanted some North Dakota, more North Dakotans involved in in some of this investment stuff. Now, I know you mentioned hiring a, um, a management company. And I, I don't know, I, I watched that process. And I mean, the two finalists ended up being from New Mexico and Chicago. And then yeah. what was what was presented to you is if they got hired, they would they would est then establish a presence in the state of North Dakota. Now, I, I think that's another thing. I think North Dakotans are really bad. We have this self-loathing thing going on where we think that if it, if it ha if it's going to be good, it has to come from out of state. So if we, if we want to hire somebody who's really smart, we got to hire them from out of state, whether it's a university president or a consulting group or whatever. One lawmaker made a joke to me. It said that the smartest person in the room is the guy from out of state with a briefcase. Um, yeah. So that almost seems kind of insulting that, that we're the basis is, well, we got to hire somebody with a presence in North Dakota. So let's hire a company that'll establish a presence in North Dakota after they're hired. That kind of seems disingenuous. Well, and, and that's part of the reason I want to visit with you today is, is that that part of the bill it is, is very short giving preference to North Dakota investment managers and, and, and then there was also a portion about waiving the prudent investor rule, which which those of us on the state investment board wish that that wouldn't have been put in the language because nobody is saying that we're going to have less returns. I, w I would say that the theory is if you have this whole a, a, a country worth of projects that your law of averages might work with you versus focusing on a smaller concentration of capital like we have in the state is where you might have more risk and not be able to spread that risk and not be able to have as much upside potential with having less number of projects but that we don't feel we'll have less return where the rub comes in with this is as commissioner godfrey said in the last meeting there are not firms doing this in our state when you look at the fact that there were 34 million dollars deployed from a venture capital in the state we don't have an active space where this is happening today we if you talk to commissioner godfrey you talk to myself you talk to Rob Lack, the superintendent from Jamestown, is the vice chair. He talked to Dave Hunter. We hope this turns into where there becomes more of a flow of capital. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that everybody on the state investment board feels that way. Dave Hunter actively campaigned against this legislation. He spoke to, he lobbied many lawmakers trying to get it defeated. Now he was very quiet about it because it's probably hugely inappropriate that somebody in his position was even doing that. But that's what he was doing behind the scenes as he was lobbying against this bill. I, th there's a a lot of people, and including a lot of the lawmakers who voted for this bill, who feel like 
um, Mr. Hunter and other people who work at the state investment board, maybe not necessarily people who sit on the board, are out to undermine this and are out to, to slow play this and, and, and to sandbag it and not not implement it in the manner in which it, it was intended to be implemented. Well, and you, and you hope that people aren't being emotional and feeling attacked for the job they do. I mean, we we I mean, you, you can look it up. I mean, we've got a really good transparency rating, a 10 out of 10. There's only us in Alaska that have a 10 out of 10. If you look at, at the SWFI for Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute, I mean, we, we have good performance. We have good governance. We have good protocols. I would say we were too conservative on this area. This is an area that the Commissioner Godfrey and myself have been bringing up for years of how do we make more of an intentional effort to invest in the state? And the second thing was, how do we make more of an effort to include the trusts, the investment houses, those that are doing investments in the state already? Because there's a large pushback when you have $8 billion that is for the long-term transformation and benefit of our entire economy. And there's no local flavor to it of investment. There's no one participating in it. What are these, these earnings aren't doing anything for us yet because this session with House Bill 1380 is the first time that we've even designated a plan of what we're gonna do with legacy fund earnings. And all they really did was pay the bonds for the bonding bill that was the other of the trifecta that's paying off the water projects in Fargo and Minot. So we haven't really, we still haven't appropriated those earnings in House Bill 1380, but we have put out intent that would be for clean, sustainable energy, for lift projects, for for um, research dollars. So we finally are going to get some bang for the buck from the earnings from the legacy. But again, the question has been, how does this help all of us? And so so where we sit today, Rob, is, is that to get this moving, I was an advocate for getting this moving. And we were talking about this in September and October before session. It took until February to have Legacy Advisory Committee say, yes, move forward with North Dakota private equity account and let's get it going. Because you and I know, and boy, believe, tell me about it, Commissioner Gottfried and I know, if we would have decided to just start this from ground zero after the legislation passes in August and becomes law, we'd be staring at each other a year later because that's how government works. You meet once a month. We have to actually have 10 meetings a year at State Investment Board. So by putting it out with firms that we already have relationships with that qualify for the parameters that we set out, which is including having a certain amount of assets currently under, under investment, the, the firms that responded, a lot of them said, no, thank you. We see this as being too politically charged and not a large enough opportunity to concentrate. And they said, no, thank you. A, a very large operator um, named Grosvenor applied. And, and we, we decided to go with two smaller firms that actually have done this in neighboring states. So part of the reason we picked them is they've done this before, Rob. So we didn't want to have to set up from ground zero, not knowing how to do this in state because there's a lot of protocols that will need to be in place, keeping an arm's length from our state investment board and us elected politicians from those investor groups that want to come in and pitch their project. We need to have pros that are handling this, that have done this before. And so the firms that we chose do this in Indiana, Wisconsin, Oregon, New Mexico, and actually 50 South that we chose. The reason we chose them is, is they're an affiliate of Northern Capital Trust, which which is is in um, Chicago, large presence in, in, in Minneapolis, handle a lot of the trust funds in the state already, and they're the custodian for state investment board and for the um, land board. So we're familiar with the companies. We're familiar with that company. The one in New Mexico might have had a better pitch, but they're a very small company, a very high concentration of assets in New Mexico. We would have been a high concentration of assets for them at $250 million, so we went with 50 South. And they have hit the ground running. They're, they're talking to all the folks they need to. They're talking to to those that are in the, the plug and play space in Fargo, looking at those projects, the yeah. lift bills, Commerce Department, Bank of North Dakota, all the industry groups, they're they're looking at going into, you know, how do they make, how do they figure this out with with trust companies, with looking to deploy assets with yeah. investment managers that are here. It's, it's, and so it's, that's the next phase. It's, it's a big job. It's, it's just the problem is, I mean, it was, I don't even think it was two weeks from the time that the, ink, the, the bill was signed into law to when, 50 South was hired. So if, if, we, if, if the bill, if the bill says to give preference to North Dakota firms, how do you do that in two weeks from the bill being, or, or whatever it was, it was days, maybe it was two weeks. I, I forget a very short amount of time from the day the bill was signed to the day 50 South was, was basically hired, was named as a finalist, I guess I should say. Well, and if you remember when I first started on the conversation here was that 
September and October, we were having robust conversations at the State Investment Board meetings, actually arguments about this, and passed the motion to have the Legacy Fund Advisory Committee re- to, to request to them for them to consider us allowing a portion of their asset allocation to be invested in state. And they did finally ratify that in February. So this was moving since September, or October for a process. And we were looking at possibly doing 100 million, in the end, decided to do 250 million. That's not the 800 million that's authorized under the bill. It's not even touching the 800 million of fixed income either. And it's not part of the, the match program. So, so there's enough funding here to do more, but we felt it was prudent to get these dollars in place invested in the state versus like I told you, starting after the bill gets signed into law in August with an exploratory program of how are we going to do this? How are we going to teach someone what we need to see? How are we going to try to recruit people to start a program fresh that has a domicile of North Dakota that has never done this before and and felt that that would take too long, that that would be that that would not put the dollars to work for the the taxpayers, for the citizens, for the bill sponsors, for State Investment Board and Legacy Fund Advisory Committee. The the problem I have, and I I, I get that, I I get and and Honestly, part of me thinks that the reason why the State Investment Board was was starting back in September was almost to try to head this legislation off. Um, and again, frankly, I, I don't I don't think Mr. Hunter has done the State Investment Board any favors with the way he handled this legislative session. I think we're trying to all move forward with a degree of trust. And I, I got to tell you, there's a lot of people who don't trust him, frankly. But let's so, somebody in the, in the live chat is saying that it's it's disingenuous to assume that local firms are always the best. And I, I mean, I think that's true. And the legislation doesn't say we have to hire a local firm, but it, it says that we have to give preference to a local firm. And I, don't, I mean, how, how would local firms even know that they could get this business before the legislation's even completed? I mean, we've, we've hired somebody to, to do it and it, it, nobody in North Dakota, I don't think really even had time. I mean, this bill, obviously had a lot of support and it was more than likely going to pass. But I just feel like we could have paused for a beat and given some local firms a chance to get in, to get in on it. We, I don't feel like we did that. We just, and it's, it's, it's a larger frustration for me because sometimes it feels like in this state, we can't tie our shoes without asking a consultant for permission first. So I I don't know, to me, that that's a very frustrating part of this, of this whole process. And I, I don't, I don't like for a minute the way that out that played out. That's fair. But again, it's it's a, it's an issue of starting from square one. I mean, we could be arguing about this in two years time if we start from square one and let governor des- and let government decide to come up with the answer. And when there, when there's not people doing this in this space today. But but th- that doesn't mean that there aren't other opportunities within within a 10 percent equity. That means 800 plus million dollars is the legislative intent under 1425. So North Dakota private equity with, and by the way, there were firms that were contacted that operated in the state. There were firms contacted. So so that's not fair to say that no one was contacted and asked to put who, to put Who their, was contacted? Um, you'll have to get that list from Dave Hunter. I mean, these these have been mentioned, some of the names have been mentioned at, at the board meetings, but I'm not gonna guess right now. I've got a couple names in my mind, but some of the ones that have been, that you might've been hearing from might not have been those that were contacted. But I have to tell you, there is a big difference between- I should, I should, I should, I should say, I haven't been contacted by any firms that were up for this business. I, I haven't talked to anybody but, like that. But some, but there's a, there's a pretty active dialogue criticizing the process. And so whoever is criticizing the process probably didn't feel they were notified, but it's not like it's going on the front page of the newspaper either. But within the circles, there's an RFP process that's put out. And this isn't to say this is the, the be all end all either. What I'm saying is there's going to be other opportunities, but the North Dakota private equity fund that was created at the behest of the legacy advisory committee, that one is, is, is the, the process is out. 50 South has been hired to do that. There should be 250 million deployed, beginning to be deployed immediately and having those conversations, those conversations are happening. So that's available. But the next piece, we're trying to figure out exactly how to do this because you're right. The concern doesn't go away. The concern is is actually amping up of how do we as financial institutions in this state participate in this. And I've heard things such as just give us $50 million to invest because we make more than you do. Okay. But does, is that really following the protocol? Do you have the risk assessment? Do you have 50% equity and 20% in real estate? And do you make direct investments in the companies like what we're looking at for this protocol? Is that 
is that apples to apples on the argument might be might not be but a couple of things that that we're throwing back and forth is is to have a another fund that is for that is for the North Dakota private investment community as spirit of the language of 1425 and having proposals of what that might look like and and that's different than how we do business now but it's something that yes you're right that legislative intent is very clear in 1425 so let's let's talk about a specific example in Jamestown. They're talking about uh, a theme park um, called the Buffalo City Park. You know, they're talking about you know asking for a sixty million dollar investment. Is that something that would fall under the auspices of fourteen twenty five? How does that? I, I I guess we all have to think about this stuff going forward because I I feel like in the future the 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 Buffalo City Park is an example of the sort of thing that that is going to be brought to the legacy fund and, and even the way that they're kind of out, they're kind of out in front. I mean, they're out, they're out in the public saying, yeah, we're going to ask for this. And they're, they're kind of running a, a campaign where they want to get support and more, more power to them, whether you support that project or not. So, I, I mean, I guess the question is, is how is this going to work? You know, if somebody has a, a, an idea or a proposal like that, how is the state investment board going to handle them? They'll go to the investment advisors that are for the different pots of, of funds, whether it's a fixed income, whether it's a North Dakota private equity, whether it's, you know, whether it's a real estate investment, whatever different asset allocations we have set up with the in-state investment program, then there will be investment managers there to do to to do the application, to do the communication. I mean, we the last thing you want to do, and everyone everyone will tell you, don't do this, don't have don't have the individual citizens and taxpayers and projects coming into the state investment board with half of us being elected officials it'll turn into a political show instead of being the objective transparent process that we that we've taken pride in having over the years at state investment board so they'll they'll be interfacing with investment managers and and that project for instance was it's it's actually the language that was that was struck from from the commerce bill was a 60 million dollar loan and so if the pro it kind of depends on how the project is put together is and 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 I've told the project organizers there and the city of Jamestown that city of Jamestown can come in for infrastructure loans if there's if there's infrastructure to run to that site the city could be a partner in that in that project local economic development etc and that's what the fixed income side is set up for is to be running the infrastructure to the public private side or replacement infrastructure for the city. You know, so that's, I mean, these are, these are new opportunities we have with House Bill 1425. The equity side would be if there's an operating entity that has a return that fits the, that fits the bill for the North Dakota Private Equity Fund. Is there a for-profit operating entity that's going to run the theme park that can, that would be going to investors saying, hey, this is the kind of return you can expect if you invest in this business. And so, so then that would be with the North Dakota Private Equity side. So it, just in, in the future, like if, if we're talking about, businesses that there's there's basically going to be a place that they can go saying well you know i want to start up a, a business making widgets in wapaton um and i i feel like i want to we can have this sort of an you know th this is what i'm offering investors this is the rate of return essentially they bring that to the consultants who work for the state advisory board there's an application process and then there's a decision that's made about whether or not that's a prudent investment yeah and the investment managers would be bringing in their list of investments that they've got ready for approval just like we do with the other investment managers and and so that's how i would envision it and and really a lot of this is you think this isn't the earliest stage investment this isn't like a legislative earmark where you have five million dollars to go to something and and it's basically here this is yours whether it happens or not where we think it's a good potential taking a chance for the state then there's the north Dakota development fund that commerce operates in the lift fund which is loans that commerce operates that's also Representative Nathy. Great bill has helped a lot of these beginning stage companies. But generally, what this North Dakota private equity side is looking at taking an, a company that is that is operating either for a while that now has an opportunity to really ramp, or a startup that has some beginning stage investors, has equity from the investors and the owners themselves, has accumulated maybe has a banking relationship, but they're ready to ramp it up. You know, so think of think of like Dodd's Pretzels when they went to a more of a national footprint. You need to have invest, investment bankers come in and help you when you go 10x or 100x from what your current business model was. And so that that's where we're hoping to fill that void where there's currently not venture capital coming in here in droves. We're actually a desert as far as venture capital goes. So we hope to help fill that gap. Well, I, I, th I think that's really the exciting part of this is, is 
one of my favorite things in the world, I think, is when North Dakotans get excited about a North Dakota brand. Like Dots Pretzels is an example. I think yeah. I think a lot of the appeal of, of Dots Pretzels is not just that they're um, – I have a very love-hate relationship with Dots Pretzels because I can't – not eat an entire bag of them every time I get them. There, we call them, and maybe we shouldn't. This is very politically correct. We call them crack pretzels in uh, in, in my household because it's terrible. And and as everybody could tell from my physique, Rob doesn't need to be eating entire bags of pretzels in in one sitting. So I love the candy bars. The dots candy bars oh, are amazing. They, they, they just put out amazing products. But like giant sunflower seeds is another yep. example. I mean, there's there's good North Dakota products, and I think. I think that's an exciting thing. I mean, not only does it generate business in the state of North Dakota, not only does it generate jobs, it generates tax revenue, it does all those wonderful things. I think it's something where people can really get excited about. And then and then people are always surprised to learn when some, when some of these products go national, like Dots Pretzels goes national or, or Cloverdale Meats. You know, is it, you know the, there was always, in, I think in uh, in Seattle, in I'm a baseball fan, so in the Seattle baseball stadium, there was a clo- big Cloverdale meat sign, right? Well, that's a North Dakota yeah. product, and I always had a lot of fun telling people that's made in North Dakota. So there, there's so much, I think, opportunity there for good ideas to get capital in the state of North Dakota, to diversify our economy, to employ North Dakotans, to generate North Dakota tax revenue, and, hey, generate some returns for the legacy fund, too. I, I don't see, assuming, obviously, every investment has risk to it, I just don't see downsides to this in the aggregate. I'm very excited. I think the synergy of having the, the tax base, the job growth, investing in ourselves is is worth the risk. And and so does everyone in the legislature. I mean, it, Representative Nathy just said at the Wilson Basin opener today, I think it was a seven votes against it. You know, so I mean, the legislature was very high on this. State Investment Board's excited about it. It's a little bit different way of doing business. So you do have some little bit of queasiness about it, but excited about the opportunity for our state. And I, and, and when I'm presenting about it, I, I mean, this is one of my most important bills for this session. I think it's really important for us to show our support to the state, and it's a great opportunity. Well, I, I think in some ways it's almost a, a historic bill in that there's a lot of consequential things, I think, that are going to happen years, decades down the road that you're going to be able to draw a line from them back to this bill and what is happening right now. It's a big deal, and uh, and I and I think we can uh, I, I think we could do it right. Let me ask you uh, this question. One one area of concern for for me, and this was even ahead of the session too, was with some of our international investments, where we were invested in places like um, like China, where or, or, or companies that that operate. Um, as sort of puppet companies for the Chinese state were invested in in Putin's regime and, and some things there. Were you aware of these investments? Um, and do we need those sorts of investments? I mean, can't we can't we find better ways to invest? There's got to be other opportunities than investing in some of these companies. Well, you're not going to like my answer, but when you're when you're dictated by the boards that 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 are the client boards for PERS, for TFFR by legacy, that you shall have X percent in international investments. Think of the think of the investment opportunities that are outside of the United States. China is going to be involved in a large percentage of those. A lot of their companies are are traded on the stock exchange today. And and no, in this environment today, I mean it's not it's not a popular thing for anyone in North Dakota to say, oh, we sure are glad you're taking advantage of those returns. But but when when you look at a life cycle of funds, if you do not have those international investments, you miss out on the ups and downs, you miss out on the ups and downs of the Asian economy and the European economy and and have that as a hedge with the United States economy. Now, I mean, there's there are probably funds that have decided to just go straight domestic. But with what we're doing to ourselves with this administration, is that going to be the best conversation and the best idea either? So it's it's not easy when you have twenty billion under investment, and then people go in and look at the different funds and different assets. There's a African Development Bank ar- argument where there was a, we were in an investment for a short amount of time, and and made seven percent and moved back out of it. And that's something where where there you know the the staff at the state investment board thought it would made sense to make seven percent on that kind of a turnaround. And you know when you look at it now, it's pretty easy to take that sound bite and say you're investing in Africa and not Western North Dakota. Why are you doing that? And so again, if we scrub the entire international allocation from all of the 20 billion funds at the state investment board, then there would not be that conversation. But well, would we be maximizing yeah. the returns? Our job is to maximize the returns. 
based on the best information we have in front of us. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, I feel like we can maximize, I mean, one of the companies that we're invested in, in the, and I don't have it in front of me, but I mean, we're invested in a company that was used to silence democracy protesters in Hong Kong. You're telling me we can't we can't make our nut on our investments without investing in something like that? We probably have stock in Facebook and Twitter as well. So, I mean, it's something where well, that, those, I mean, those are those are American a, companies, and I realize there's a lot of controversy, but they're also not operating as puppets for a regime that has two million people in concentration camps. Well, I mean, it's it's something where the investment advisors are watching these investments as well, trying to make sure that, that the missteps don't happen. So again, when you're in international funds, I mean, you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to pick out a couple of them, Rob. I can, I understand. I mean, you're, you're going to be able to find some of those, but there's an ESG movement and then there's a movement that's opposite of ESG and the opposite of ESG is, is like, you know, we're not going to invest in any kind of companies that, that talk poorly about us with our fossil fuels economy. We're going to not invest in companies that have any kind of investments in China. I mean, it's something where that hasn't been the case of what our investment advisors are asked to do. They're asked to either go with the international allocation, the real estate allocation, the domestic equity allocation, and and bring back um, and then have a lower as as low of a risk rating and high of a return as possible. And that's yeah. that's how this business works. And people don't like to hear that, but that's that's basically how well, it works in a nutshell. I, I I think though that when we're talking about the public's money, it, it doesn't have to work that way. I, I think is the point. And I realize, I mean, this is this is maybe dangerous ground that I'm treading because there's plenty of people out there who don't want to invest in, you know, companies that finance pipelines. They don't want to invest in companies right. that uh, have anything to do with coal or oil or natural gas or whatever. So I, yeah. I get that and I understand that. But gosh, you know, do we have to be invested in, in companies that, uh, that censor people that that suppress pro-democracy? I don't think that we do. And I don't, I don't I'm not sure that shrugging our shoulders and saying, oh, that's the way it works. I don't know that that's a good enough answer. I don't know what more to tell you. Yeah, I mean, it's something where these are, again, there's billions of dollars that are invested in international funds. And so, so I don't, there's, there's literally thousands and thousands of investments in those funds. And we certainly don't sit at state investment board and pour through every individual one of those. So, so what you're asking me to do, I don't know, but except for, for me to go as the, as the chair of state investment board and ask, to have all the international investment allocations scrubbed. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's reasonable either. I get your point if you can grab a couple investments and keep beating on that, but we don't go through each individual line item, and, and I don't know what more to say about that item. Yeah, I don't. I guess I don't know either, um, but I, I feel like we could do better. But I, I do appreciate the time, and there are a lot of exciting things happening. I don't want to rain on the on the a larger parade here of, uh, of a lot of very good things that we're going to be doing, and, and honestly, I hope there is more scrutiny of, the state investment board is that, you know, we probably should ask some of these questions. I feel like a lot of the things the state investment board does, you know, flies under the radar. And our, I hope our state as a whole can can maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe some of our elected leaders and state officials can can free themselves of, of sort of a tyranny of consultancy where we're just kind of doing what they tell us to do. And I, I don't know. I feel like we could take the reins a little bit. I feel like 1425 is the beginning of us taking the reins a little bit and start making some of these decisions and start making more of them in line with North Dakota values. So last last comment to you. Well, we just have to make sure that we're beating the benchmarks because if we start if we start messing with the process and don't hit the benchmarks, when I'm telling you that we made 31%, year over year from March 31 till now, the benchmarks that we're benchmarking ourselves again, which is made up of indices, so it's not us making this up, is 28%. So if we wouldn't have made 28, you wouldn't be very happy with this either. So if we're down here making 20 or 25, because we start as elected officials going in and saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. I mean, then then we're not growing the corpus. Yeah. We're not having the dollars there for the PERS, for the re employee's retirement, for the teacher retirement for the legacy earnings. So it's it's a hard job to balance. And I and I understand where you're coming from. There's a lot of people coming from that angle. And there's and there's believe me, there's scrutiny. There's increased scrutiny from from the staff level, from our investment managers level, from these things that have been have, have been brought to our attention. And so I, I appreciate you bringing that up. I mean that's that's the reason for for media. That's the reason for constituents, for concerns, for taking those those concerns. And we're hearing, we're listening. I know the 
the, the lobbyists for the trust departments and the banks said, you know what, we feel like we're being listened to, and it's been a, been a long time coming. So I guess I can take that as, as maybe a C on my report card. We've got to get it up to an A where we're actually feeling like we're making a difference and having some involvement where they say, thank you, glad to be involved, glad to be part of this great process that we're investing funds in North Dakota, investing responsibly, still have the benchmark returns are better, and uh, it's great for the future of our state. So thank you for your time and for asking the questions as you do. Yeah, well, absolutely. And thank you for your time and thank you for coming on. Appreciate it.